So uh, good morning uh, all, we'll um, welcome here in, um, in uh, the session on weighing evidence and assessing uncertainty. My name is Prabhat Agarwal and I'll be one of uh, your chairs together with my colleague Derek Knight here. My, I work uh, at the European Commission uh, in the Department for um, Communications Network and uh, Technologies where I lead a sector on, on evidence-based policy making. I won't say anything else about myself but uh, um, we'll be your chairs uh, throughout this morning, just, uh, and in case you quite didn't quite hear the announcement, uh, the main housekeeping rule uh, is to remember to switch off your mobile phones. This session will be web streamed. Uh, if you are um, on Twitter, you can use those two hashtags together and uh, to ask questions or make comments. And if you, uh, if you have questions that way, I should be able to receive them during the morning as well. That's all from me. Uh, over to you, Derek. Okay. My name's Derek Knight. I'm the Senior Scientific Advisor at the European Chemicals Agency in Helsinki. And I'm absolutely fascinated at this, this session. Can you hear? Can you hear? I was told the microphone was infallible. It obviously isn't. I'm Derek Knight from the European Chemicals Agency in Helsinki. And uh, I'm really looking forward to helping to chair this uh, fascinating session this morning on weight of evidence and the interrelated idea of scientific uncertainty and how you describe it and how you communicate and how we use it for regulatory science purposes. So I think we ought to start the session now. We're going to try and stick rigidly to the timing because of the web streaming. So without further ado, I'll let Probat introduce the first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Lawrence uh, Romberg um, from Gradient Corporation, who is, uh, I won't say too much about him because uh, I think you're more interested in what he's going to say, but Lawrence Romberg is one of uh, um, the leaders in the area of quantitative risk assessments and um, in this domain. So without further ado, over to uh, Dr. Romberg, please. Uh, th thank you. Um, assuming this is working okay. Um, and where is my slide show start? Someone's going to have to po point me to the, oh, there we go. Thank you. <clears throat> well, my job is to kick off this session and talk about it in, in large and general terms. And there's a lot to talk about, so it will be in general terms. There are things I'm going to touch on that I wish I had more time to talk about, but many of the speakers that follow will have some time to talk about those things. So weighing evidence and assessing uncertainties I'm mostly going to be talking about qualitative uncertainty, so what you fold that into the weighting of, ev of evidence. Where have we been and where are we going? This is a topic that is much discussed around the world with projects going on in various places. There are several in the United States. I know there are several um, 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 in Europe. There's one going on here at EFSA. So, Let's start out. What are we doing here? Risk assessment. This is my definition of risk assessment, bringing to bear existing scientific information and critical interpretation of that information on questions about the existence, nature, and magnitude of risks that may be posed by an agent. This is important. It's bringing to bear the information. The information is not itself the assessment. Critical interpretation of the information is part of that bringing to bear. I think that perspective uh, is something that w it was important to bear in mind in our plenary, plenary session yesterday and maybe uh, some of the times got lost a little. The data itself is not the assessment. It is making sense of those data and what we're talking about in weight of evidence is how to do that. But the problems are the information is always to some degree incomplete. We don't have every test that we could do. It's indirect, where you're looking at animals at high doses to look at humans at low doses and their potential risks. Inherently unobservable phenomena are of concern. We're never going to see a one in a million rate of cancer risk um, in an epidemiologic study as a direct measure. 
but we might be concerned about that and preventing that. So we're going to have to be extrapolating beyond what we can see to what we are worried about. We often have contradictory information. We have something that is positive in mice and the same endpoint is negative in rats. Are humans like the mice or like the rats? We have to decide how to resolve those kinds of questions. Um, alternative explanations of these data with very different risk consequences than are possible. And this is all done in a public process in the face of conflicting interests. And so there's a real question of how do we come to some sort of official evaluation of all of these kinds of information that is possible to act on. Now, the general weight of evidence question is as big as science. That's what science does. We look at evidence and we, we, we look at, at, at data and we try to find out about the world. But the regulatory process cannot actually sustain pure science's suspension of judgment until we have ultimate resolution. We don't just say, oh, further study is necessary. We have to make decisions. We have to decide what to do and we have to act, even in the face of some uncertainty. Even in the face of the fact that there's diversity of opinion among scientists. We can't get, wait until science has an absolute consensus. So this skeptical process that's part of a science has to be part of our evaluation but it has to play a somewhat different role in weight of evidence evaluation here. The regulatory process needs to come up with findings, you know, bases for action, um, and it has to have those judgments on those things delegated to a set of people who are doing it. This is not we poll the whole scientific community about things. There are people who are assigned to interpret science for the rest of us. That means who is chosen to do that is a very important thing. So those are different things between science and the scientific method in general and our application of using science and risk assessment that I think are important to bear in mind. So how did we get to this juncture? Well, forgive me for using American examples in my uh, uh, um, um, slide that I use in American talks here, um, but I think this applies more generally. In the older systems, we sort of had what I would call rules-based frameworks that presume the relevance of the testing data that we have. It was really a matter of testing, and if the tests come out positive, that shows that the agent is a, a toxicant of this kind, uh, and that would apply. You recognize that there is some experimental uncertainty, but the main question really is, have you validly found this in your tests, and you presume that they're relevant? Um, as we get deeper understanding of toxicity, we realize the inadequacy of that kind of thinking, and that toxicity isn't just an inherent property of the compound, it's the interaction of the compound with the biological system. And so we have these newer judgment-based framework systems. And those are basically saying, here are all of the issues that you need to think about, and in the end, it's a judgment that you work through all of these issues and, and to articulate your judgment. But then the main question is there is, what is the sufficiency of evidence for conclusions, and how can you make that consistent from case to case? Um, and there are some examples of things in America that have prompted a big re-examination of this, but we know that that's wider than that, since, as I say, these re-examinations are going on around the world. Some new developments that are affecting things here um, are probably worthwhile just naming at the beginning. First of all, there are all these new regulatory programs of various kinds that need a lot of assessments. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, a lot of call for doing these assessments in a way that is sort of consistent from one case to another. Um, we have new kinds of toxicity concerns. I just gave as examples endocrine disruption and mixtures, but there are others. Things that we don't have an established paradigm for in terms of testing or they pose new challenges to the testing and new questions for risk assessment. Increasing sophistication of mode of action understanding, which I just noted for a second ago. Now we can look at adverse outcome pathways, or there are gene environment interactions that we can discover by, uh, in, in epidemiologic studies. We understand species specificity of responses and other things like this. The more deeply we understand how this interaction of agents with the living system works, uh, that puts perspectives on uh, uh, assessments of toxicity, uh, application of studies to uh, the target population, which I'm going to be talking as though we're talking about humans here, but it obviously goes more widely than that, um, and so on. Uh, that, as I say, open up questions as, as well as help uh, answer some kinds of questions, but they're new kinds of questions. New kinds of toxicity testing. 
uh, all the new high throughput gene uh, expression microarrays, um, lots of new in vitro tests, the interest in replacing animal studies, uh, animal tests with other kinds of in vitro methods and so on, um, makes a whole new array of kinds of evidence that we have to figure out how to bring into our weight of evidence paradigm. And then there's this rise of systematic review mandates and methods. Um, and uh, an understanding that with the burgeoning information, we have to have a, a, a systematic and objective way of evaluating data. And there are a lot of place, things that are put into place there. But that in itself is not the evidence evaluation. It is not the integration. It's not weight of evidence. It is putting the evidence on the table. And we have to sort of see how those new processes, as they stuff lots of information um, into the weight of evidence process, can now be handled in the integration phase. So what is the problem here? What is the weight of evidence problem? Well, one is some people don't even want to call it weight of evidence because they think it's, that's too vague. And so they say we're calling it evidence integration. I'm going to continue to use the word weight of evidence, but if you prefer, you can substitute the other term. On the one hand, it's just a metaphor. We have these different things. The data are not, in, are not complete enough or in agreement enough in themselves to definitively prove uh, a particular uh, question. And so we have to somehow consider what our interpretations are better supported than others. But if you're not just using it as a metaphor, you're actually trying to use it as a method, then the question is, how do we develop that method to do this in a way that is replicable and uh, transparent? We want to use all of the data in some ways, do some systematic processes, and get an objective procedure to lay out the basis for the judgments that we have to make. There's no getting away from the judgments, but we want to try to explain what those judgments are and not just say, this is my judgment and there, therefore there you go. So what kind of questions need a weight of evidence approach? Well, certainly the obvious one here is hazard characterization, identifying what kinds of hazards, what kind of toxicity endpoints an agent is capable of causing. Um, under what conditions of exposure. And that's the usual setting that we're talking about here. But we shouldn't ignore the fact that other things like um, um, deciding whether a mode of action is well enough established to use in a process or alternative approaches for quantitative analysis for dose response or for departure from uh, a default presumption or something like that. These are all questions and any other kind of question, for that matter, where interpretation of a body of evidence and coming to judgment about what it says about something like that is at issue. Uh, so there are more general applications than the usual hazard identification one. And we really do need a framework here because we want to foster good practice and sound application. We want to define what sound practices are. We want to encourage consistency from case to case so that uh, each chemical is treated in a, in, a, in a reasonably consistent way one to the other, and we don't just make this up each time as we go along. Um, we want to set out and support all these, and, and give the support for assumptions and procedures that are needed to fill data gaps and the inferential processes and so on and so forth. The idea here is, we, again, we don't want to do that differently for each case. We want to say, if you have to make assumptions, we want a consistent way of doing this across cases. And we're also explaining the method and its rationale and the basis for coming to these judgments to the affected public. The affected public actually includes the risk managers who will have to make decisions on this and to the general public and the stakeholders as well. So that's why we really need to spell this out in, in a method and not just sort of do it to muddle through. So everybody now has goals like this. We want to, in the face of this need to reevaluate our processes, to review some of the frameworks that are out there already um, and see what their good properties are, what their shortcomings are, where they work, where they don't work, where they have difficulty. Evaluate them from the insight and get insights about their methods, their rationales, uh, and so on. Um, and I guess then the thing is to, uh, in, in my own implementation of this process, uh, propose some key phases to the weight of evidence process so that we can sort of compare these, these different methodologies as they are doing the same task one to the other because they are all very complicated things that have to go through a lot of processes themselves. So you want to compare them on their comparable points. And we want to draw from these some key aspects, some of the best practices, some of the pitfalls and things like that, get some insights, not to find one to copy, but rather how can we by looking at the ways people have struggled with this question in the past, gain some insights about how to move forward.
Well, um, I'm really going to be spending some of my time talking about a particular survey that we did that did exactly that. In fact, those goals were the goals from this paper um, that uh, is available. And if anybody wants to know, just email me and I will show you how to get this paper. Um, but I'm going to be sort of talking about some of what we what we found in this paper um, um, uh, that appeared uh, in 2013, uh, describing our survey of not every, but a good deal and a good number of frameworks, and our um, uh, drawing of our own thoughts and conclusions about best practices and insights into what might be done in the future. The idea here, as I say, to document these approaches, look for commonalities among them, Everyone sort of sees this as a problem and treats it more or less the same way, but also examine differences and why those differences are there. Look for best practices to emulate and draw some insights. So we looked at uh, over 50 different frameworks. And as I say, this is not every framework there is, but we tried to look at enough that we were looking broadly and tried to get representations of things that came from public sector, private sector, various kinds of places, various kinds of uh, countries and regions. Um, and so on. We also included the ones that uh, the National Academy of Sciences in its criticism of EPA's criti of risk assessment that prompted the, EP the US process of re-examination of these things and they named several frameworks. We made sure to include those. We started out with a white paper uh, that basically uh, was a basis for a workshop discussion. Uh, with lots of tables of things and a basis for looking through this. We had the workshop discussion and then wrote this paper that I showed you in the previous slide as a result of that. Uh, I uh, emphasize that this is not review or evaluation of these frameworks, nor is it finding one to copy, but it's looking for insights into how the process can happen, has been tried. As I say, looking at people grappling with the question, what can we learn from that? So. There are lots of appendices in this, and they actually sort of show all of these kinds of evaluations and tables. Who was developed it, what were the purposes, the main applications, notable features, and so on. I'm not going to show you these many, many tables. You wouldn't get them. But as I say, um, you wouldn't be able to see them on the screen, but um, um, they are there and available. Um, I think that these are all frameworks in some sense. That is, there are guidance-like procedures that are specifying operations and structures to follow um, based on some kind of stated rules. And the aim is to capture the principles and valid scientific inferences that you would do by coming to a scientific judgment into that procedure. So we're trying to make a procedure that by doing it, you're doing what you should do when you're coming to valid scientific judgments. And um, uh, you want those rules because you want something that are standards that analysts can be held to. Say, yes, you did this the right way. Um, you should have done this, you sh shouldn't have done that, and so on and so forth. Um, but the aim is to be objective and operational. And when I say operational, I mean in the sense of something, what does that mean, one minute? Oh. I'm sorry, what? Oh, oh, okay, 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 good. So, <laughs> I, I was panicking here. I have one minute left? Oh, no. Okay. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I'm a little rattled here. Where am I? Okay. Um, so operational in the sense that you can specify things that people could do, and when people do those things that you can write down what it is that they have to do, they are executing this method. That's actually rather hard to bring off when judgment is such a big uh, um, part of it. Um, and uh, so really the challenge is automating judgment. And if you're too prescriptive, you lose credibility because it's just a conventionalized interpretation. And any scientific, uh, scientific evaluation of what you got would say, oh, this is all wrong because you're just following these rules blindly and you've, it's, the rules have misled you. On the other hand, if it's too unstructured, you lose your warrant as a, an official assessor to say, oh, I did this the right way and uh, you should believe me, not just because I say so. Uh, so, we define four phases here, and these, I think, are just so that we can compare these frameworks on similar parts of their processes. Um, the first one is defining the causal question and developing criteria for study selection. That's setting things up. So this is what we're trying to do and what will therefore be relevant. Second is developing and then applying criteria to review the individual studies, their relevance and their quality, 
um, and so on. Pull the data out in a systematic way so that we're not just cherry picking data from the studies that we're interested in. Uh, three is to integrate and evaluate. That's what I'll be talking about most. And four, draw conclusions. Yes, obviously draw conclusions. I think it's important to split out the drawing conclusions from the evaluation of evidence because when you're now drawing conclusions, you're interacting with the risk management process and what kinds of certainty it requires before you can say things and so on. So the categories you might be putting things into are in some ways uh, set by the risk management process's needs, and I think it's good to separate that from the integration and, and judgment arrivals itself. Here's an example of all these tables, just to show you we have them, there are dozens of them, and so I just want to let you know that you can get these by asking for the, for the paper, and uh, I can provide them. So, phase one, defining the question and the criteria for selection. Um, so, again, we want to define the causal question or hypothesis that we're really evaluating. Doing that well is important. Define the criteria for study inclusion, plan the literature search, design the search and strategies and so on, select the studies and extract the data. That's all sort of fairly um, obvious things to go in there. What are the best practices that we defined here? I'm just jumping right to the conclusions because I obviously can't go over 50 versions of how, how this is done as is done in, in, in our paper. Um, well, really defining the hypothesis well up front is very important, and problem formulation can be very useful in this step. Problem formulation is more than just, we want to know if this is a carcinogen in humans or not. There are subsequent subsidiary questions, and those will be chemical specific, that will be the things that a good assessment is really going to have to grapple with. Just as a very quick example, I was involved in a compound where it was neurotoxic, when it was given in, a, in some bioassays, but there were other neurotoxicity tests that were done where it was part of a mixture, and it was more than half of the mixture that was given, and yet it wasn't neurotoxic. So now the question is, is that mixture, and this is a compound that you usually, but not always, be exposed to in the world as that mixture. So now the question is, what does the role of that question about the difference between the mixture and the pure compound say about our evaluation of the toxicity of that thing? And do we say, oh no, we'll just get rid of the mixture because that's not in our criteria for inclusion? Or do you say, no, that's an important part of our scientific evaluation? Thinking about those kinds of questions ahead of time is really important. And we plan the literature search and the exclusion criteria and so on and organize the data so that we can then go on to phase two in the evaluation. I think that in, at this point you don't want to exclude any studies, but you're sort of showing the basis for up and down weighting them in the, what, what you have found um, in, in their characterization. Uh, so we want systematic approach. Um, that is to say, we want to avoid cherry picking and we want to avoid being accused of cherry picking. That means not only giving all apparently relevant studies some evaluation, um, but also not just looking at the featured outcomes of those studies, the ones that are mentioned in the abstract. Often you find that uh, lots of things were evaluated and the ones that come out positive kind of get to the abstract and the ones that get, come out negative uh, don't get into the abstract and yet they might be relevant to your question. So you have to look out for that kind of thing. Um, consistent process for reviewing so that you're not basically building up the studies that you have the results you like and denigrating the studies that you don't like. Um, evaluate strengths and weaknesses, but then the question is, what do you do with the lesser studies? They're still observations. In some sense, the weaknesses are often ambiguities in the outcome rather than an obvious, if you say that, if you say that a, a, an outcome is due to the shortcomings of a study, that itself is a conclusion, and you have to sort of build your thinking into that. How much information does this give? Bad studies are just giving more ambiguous information, but maybe not no information. And you have to think about your procedure. What do you do with those studies? And at what point do you start eliminating things? Uh, best practices. Again, consider the uh, study quality, the design, <laughs> confounders, bias and chance, and so on. These are all the kinds of things that would um, uh, p possibly compromise the direct internal validity, the uh, um, um, uh, sort of dependability of the results per se for those studies. And you can characterize them based on quality, as I say, don't eliminate them right off the bat. Um, and assess all of these uh, things 
and how they would fit into things that you now later want to do in the evidence integration, things like internal consistency, biological plausibility, and temporality, all those kinds of things. Do they somehow fit with the kinds of biological interpretations that you will have to come to later on that you hope to have defined ahead of time in your problem formulation so that you know that these are things that you want to attend to? So then a systematic presentation, not just positive results, also the nulls and negatives. Laying everything out in tables is good, and you can see to the degree to which these studies agree or don't agree. Um, and um, uh, as I say, we have this question of internal validity, um, the, how reliable are the results for the thing that they are reporting. Um, and then we have a relevance question, which is a very separate question, and that quality by itself does not help. Um, uh, it's a question of interpretation, and so that actually is now sort of um, um, leaking into the later phases of interpretation when you now decide what makes something relevant or not. And I would not, uh, I, I would be remiss to not mention that there are other data that are relevant but aren't really even about the compound itself, are just our knowledge of the underlying biology and the toxicity processes, adverse outcome pathways that are being tweaked by these chemicals. Um, um, our understanding of physiology and so on and so forth that is important to recognize as well will be part of what you might want to assemble. But here, let's get to the integration of evidence. This is the main thing. There are several different kinds of evidence that we're going to have to uh, deal with here. First of all are the obvious ones. Observed toxicity processes that represent an instance of a more general one that would operate in parallel in the target population. That's an animal bioassay and you say, Humans are mammals and mice are mammals, and so if it happens in mice, maybe it happens in humans, that kind of thing. We see the process that we're worried about itself. And then this question of how do we generalize the ability to cause that across species in order to apply it. Uh, observed biological perturbations or effects that represent candidate elements of a possible mode of action. In other words, here's looking at underlying things. We're looking at uh, some cytotoxicity. We're looking at some gene expression change. We're looking at some physiological change and so on. That is not itself at the toxicity, but is part of um, a possible mode of action. Correlation of the outcome with the, in the, with the target population study concern in other cases. So for instance, if you say uh, decrease in lung function in a worker population is often correlated with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease developing later on, even if you don't say that that lung function is necessarily a mechanistic part of the ultimate endpoint, if it's always going along with it, in some sense that's kind of evidence. And then just analogy with other cases. So these are very diverse kinds of things that we are talking about here. And I think it's important to realize that when we're talking about integration, there are really two kinds of integration that we can talk about. One is multiple observations of the thing of interest itself. And this is the example, it, basically this comes down to meta-analysis. In epidemiology, we are testing, we are looking at the phenomenon that we are worried about in the population often, and we have several studies. And so the question is, do they agree with one another? Uh, but there's no extrapolation really, well, I suppose there's always some extrapolation, but you know what I mean. The idea is that we are looking at the thing itself, and the real question is the repeatability of that, and it's a meta-analysis question. Um, and the, that is as distinct from what we often have to do in risk assessment for chemicals, where we have indirect information. We have animal data, in vitro data, mode of action data that are not the observation itself. And so the question of how those data come to bear on the inference that we have to make and the jumps that you need, the in interpretive leaps that you make to do that are, become very important. And that's a different kind of situation. Um, I think this is an important p point that we really glean from looking at this stuff, the span of generalization. When you think about it, we're in a difficult position here compared to pure science, where pure science makes a big general law and then says this will apply to all these cases and then you can test it. We will have a limited set of observations. And yet, because of this need to extrapolate from where we can do those observes, observations to the population of, of interest for risk assessment, we have to make a generalization. So we have to generalize from a few instances to a larger thing without a real chance to sort of test how broadly that genera generalization um, uh, um, applies. That's the real challenge in interpreting the data, is to say, this will have to apply to other things we recognize the dangers in just be, you know, 
what properties of the mouse bioassay that was positive do we say extrapolate? Is it all mammals? Is it all rodents? Is it all mice? Um, is it for this endpoint? Is it all you know tumors? Whatever. Um, we have to decide that based on a limited set of instances, and that's a difficult task to do. So here, it basically is the big dilemma that we have. Um, sailing between Scylla and Charybdis, like Odysseus had to go between the two dangers, and the closer he got to one, the, the farther he stayed away from one, the closer he got to the other. Um, on the one hand, we have, um, well, I'll, I'll start on the, on the right-hand side, rules-based systems, as I said, where we say we have this algorithm, this decision tree, this objective set of processes, and we just go through it, and we justify our conclusions by saying we went through that process, and this is how it came out, and therefore that is the answer. Um, and uh, the, the danger of that, obviously, is that um, uh, it's only as good as the rules. Um, and uh, it, uh, as I discussed before, um, it can get ossified. It doesn't uh, um, um, s seem to actually deal with the real scientific complexities. On the other hand, we have uh, uh, judgment and a pure judgment-based system saying, well, I'm an expert and this is my judgment putting all these complicated things together in this case. And uh, the difficulty there is uh, how to make that transparent and how to make that convincing to um, other people and how do you choose the judges and so on and so forth. And it's a little bit hard to find the right path here. You go closer to one, you get farther from the other, and um, the, the question is, how do you find your way in between those? And on the bottom is what I'm suggesting here, structured judgment, which is to guide your evaluations and record the results. In other words, try to record the process of judgment itself and where it comes from in the data and make that uh, articulation of how you got to that judgment be the part that makes it transparent. So I'm going to quickly go over some of the strategies that we found in these 50 frameworks, caricaturing them to be sure just to give you the idea of the span of kinds of things. And these are the ones that I'm going to mostly be talking about. I'll just try to go through them rather quickly because the time is short here. So as I say, we have these rules-based systems, sort of the old way of doing it. We define the processes, the criteria, decision trees, and so on. It's operational in the sense that anyone can follow it, anyone with at least some amount of training. And the data that you have dictate the path through this tree. Um, you can do screenings and ratings and things like that, but they all go to very objective criteria. And here, the wisdom of the scientific judgment process it has to be captured in the algorithm. And it's built into the rules. It succeeds only to the degree that it really is built into the rules. And when that wisdom changes or evolves or gets more complicated than the rules, the rules tend to fail. The primary output here is the decision, which box you end up in in the end. And the characterization of uncertainty about that is a secondary thing. And yes, you could do sensitivity analysis. If I took this path, then the, this box, and so on, and this decision point, how would I come out? But the primary output is the decision. So as I say, the wisdom is built in, but it might be inadequate or faulty. Uh, the decision points often beg the question. They say, when the data are sufficient to conclude that it's this, then conclude that it's this. Well. How do you do that? It's hard to make these into, into operational objective rules um, um, and, 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 and still preserve the kind of judgment that you need. And it tends to ossify into conventional wisdom, and it doesn't really move along with the understanding of, of, of things as they develop. And it deals very poorly with ambiguity, um, because alternative viable interpretations just didn't get arrived at by going through the decision tree. Um, and if you have an amb ambiguity, you don't really know which way to go on this branch, and then what do you do? You go both ways, and it doesn't really help you then. So how about evidence-based toxicology? This is done on the, on the, on the uh, analogy with evidence-based medicine that is much more well-developed. We've talked about the Cochrane Initiative and so on and so forth. But the Cochrane Initiative, that's an example of the multiple observations of the same thing. You're looking at therapies, and you're saying, we do lots of tests of the eff efficacy of this therapy. And then the real question is, do they agree with one another? The challenge here for applying this as a model for toxicology is the indirectness of so much of our information. And um, um, uh, 
this is sort of a, for those who are interested in epistemology, sort of a logical positivism approach to things. You, you have to be able to demonstrate in the data the thing that you are, um, uh, that you are claiming. And if there's ambiguity about that, you say it's un undecided. We can't tell from the data that we have. That isn't very helpful for a lot of regulatory processes. So it really needs clear-cut findings to come to consensus. It doesn't really characterize uncertainty very well or differentiate possibilities among unproven assumptions. It just says you can't tell. Um, and as I say, it doesn't deal very well with this indirectness that we have. So yes, there are possibilities here, but there are also some real challenges. How about expert judgment elicitation? Here's where you get experts to sit down and you ask them structured questions and try to actually say, well, experts somehow embody the knowledge and the distribution of thinking. And if you get the right distribution of experts and quiz them the right way, you can actually build up um, 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 a sort of an evaluation of their tendencies to believe this way or that way. It's combining expert judgment amongst a lot of experts. Um, the output, again, is not a decision here, but a characterization of the distribution of expert opinion, if it's done well. Um, and um, uh, you can get this sort of degree of belief in alternative explanations, and that can be very helpful. Um, but the choice of experts in the framing of queries can really affect the outcome. We talked about framing in the plenary uh, session yesterday. Choice of experts can be, can be a real issue. Um, it records their judgments, but not their bases. So you say, what is the judgment? But why did you think that? That's sort of in the person's head. And so therefore, it doesn't really, it's transparent from the point of view of methodology, of the process, procedure. But it's not really transparent from the point of view of reasoning, because the reasoning is all just, well, that's what the experts thought. Um, and um, the, then I guess there's a question of, does this distribution of the thoughts of this actually reflect the real scientific uncertainty in some objective sense? Um, I would like to mention the mode of action human relevance framework um, as a, uh, a method. Uh, IPCS has been developing this, you, um, I'm sure, are um, familiar. The idea here now is you need a much more uh, defined mode of action thing. You look at the various steps of mode of action in those studies in the animals that you see as positive and that are candidates for evidence of an effect in humans. And then you say, what do we know about the existence of those uh, key events uh, in humans and their possibility. And that's a way of working through the evaluation of a mode of action argument. Um, quickly, I'm just going to show these. We can't talk about this without talking about the Bradford Hill postulates or considerations or whatever they call various things. Bradford Hill, of course, set these up to look at epidemiological studies. They're for observational studies rather than for um, um, uh, experimental studies. That is to say, when we just observe things, uh, here are signs. These are, these are sort of causality tracks, so to speak. You know, these are the kinds of things that you would see if there were a causal process. And um, I'm not going to go through them because I think they're familiar. What I will say is that there's a lot of interest in updating these and extending them to try to um, accommodate experimental data, mode of action, things like that. So some of these things are being redefined to say, well, temporality is not just the disease comes after the exposure, but once you understand the steps of a mechanistic uh, series of, of, of mode of action things, uh, do those things make sense in their temporal sequence and the, the dose levels that are needed to cause them and so on, so on and so forth. And they can be, the, the thinking can be extended to those. Um, here's an interesting example of something trying to blend epidemiology and human, uh, so epidemiology and animal data into a basis for an overall uh, decision that came from uh, Adami et al. published a couple of years ago, a few years ago now. Um, and basically, I put this up here, one, to show that things like this exist, because that's one of the big questions that we have, is we have epidemiology on one hand, and we have all of these animal data, mechanistic data, and so like that on the other hand, that are, epidemiology are more or less direct, uh, animal data and so like that are more or less indirect, and we have to make that jump and that inference. This has some benefits in being able to sort of graphically show you where your results are, your, your thoughts, overall judgments are coming from, but it also does tend to uh, do something that I wonder if is a good idea, which is to say making a judgment based on the epidemiology as a separate issue, and then making a separate judgment based on animal data, and then just combining the judgments. 
We know that this happens in the IARC process, where the animal people are in one room and the epidemiologists are in another room, and then they come and they just tell you how strong they think that their case was, and you just combine the strengths. But there are a lot of cases where what happens in the epidemiology and in the mode of action helps you interpret what was going on in the human data and helps you understand the human data. One case I've worked on a lot is formaldehyde, where there are real questions about the biological plausibility of inhaled formaldehyde having systemic effects that come from the animal data, and that would affect the interpretation of the, or at least should affect the interpretation of the human data. So that's a, another issue there to be thought of, is how do these integrations go? Um, uh, best practices, well, yes, you assess the modes of action and evaluate the null and the positive and so on and so forth. Um, I'm gonna go through these rather quickly because some of this is sort of obvious here. But you do want to note your assumptions, especially when they're ad hoc. And it's so easy to rescue a, an idea by saying, oh, well, yes, that could happen, or this could be just that so-and-so, or sometimes there is something that makes this uh, kind of, 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 of effect happen. And so the fact that it doesn't really match our overall um, um, reasoning, it, 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 it doesn't disprove it. And you can sort of explain away a lot of things. You have to be careful about that. It's a very seductive um, type of thing to do. Um, 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 and uh, I think that, the, as I say, the idea is to present not just your conclusions, but the reasoning behind your conclusions, and um, um, to recognize the role of generalization of effects from one to another as you are doing your conclusions. And uh, that one's pretty much redundant. Let's go on to best practices for phase four. Well. Okay, so you've, if you've done a good job at evaluating all these things, you've come up with some judgments, you come up with your reasoning behind the judgments and your alternatives. And I think, although I don't have a nice diagram, that the kind of thing that was being talked about in the plenary yesterday of characterizing the possibilities and the alternatives and their relative support is something that ought to go to the risk manager as part of the decision process. So, it's, you know, to recognize this process of, 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 of evidence integration isn't gonna come up with a definitive answer. It's gonna come up with the degree to which we know things and how well we can know them in view of the, of, of the of information that we have. And getting across a, a communication of that is the, is the challenge. Um, I'm gonna end my last few minutes here by very quickly talking about my own approach to this uh, going between Scylla and Charybdis. And I call it hypothesis-based weight of evidence. Here's a paper um, that I have on it. Here's some publications on the method. I don't expect you to read this. I just have them in the slides again. If anyone wants to refer to them in the future, I'll be happy to send these to you. Here are applications of, of this method to a lot of the questions of the day here on toxicity. Um, and we've got published uh, um, versions of, of our applications of this. And the idea behind hypothesis weight of evidence is to say, first of all, let's ask, what is it that makes data evidence? We just take that as, oh, yeah, you know, it's an animal study. We use animal study as evidence for a human effect because that's what we do. Uh, and that's the way we've always done it. What is it? And that's where you recognize, well, it's a generalization of that effect. Um, it's a, a statement that there's something about what happened in the mice that would also happen in humans, and that's why it's evidence. And if it wouldn't, if those same processes wouldn't happen to humans, it wouldn't be relevant evidence. So what is it that we think? Even if we only have to hypothesize it, even if we only say, well, they're both mammals and mammals are often similar, that's the best we can do. If that's the best you can do, you should say that and recognize that because that helps you see how compelling that result was. Um, then when we get observed outcomes that are candidates for evidence, we say, why do we think they happen where they did? Where they did means in the species, at the dose levels, in the target tissues that they did. But more importantly, and this always gets left out, why do we think they didn't happen where they didn't? Why is it that other target tissues, potential target tissue you can imagine, didn't respond, other species didn't respond, other doses didn't respond? That's part of your evaluation as well, the reasoning for why you didn't see things that you didn't see, and that often gets left out. Um, when you look at the did happen factors, would they also apply in the target population? That's the generalization question. Is it just that they might apply or that they're known to apply because you can measure them the way you try to do in the mode of action rel human relevance framework or what? Uh, when there are discrepant observations, uh, how do we account for them? Because they're there. They need their explanation as well. And part, you're explaining away things that don't fit is also part of your evaluation. 
And so are all of our things observable or just reasonable guesses based on wider knowledge or you know, it usually happens that way or we can give other examples? Or are they just ad hoc assumptions without any evidence? Just we need to explain an otherwise puzzling phenomenon and say, well, there must be something and we don't have any reason that it couldn't be, so there it is. So if you can just wrap up so we can take a few questions. Very good, okay. Yes. Um, so in any case, the, the idea here is then to evaluate your um, overall proposition in the face of looking through how all of these things um, uh, and the refutations sort of play through. I would like to say my way of saying the operational thing that you have to do is to fill out a table like this called an accounts table, which is to say you have all of the facts, all of the results, the positives, the negatives, and so like that down the side. And for each one you say, if this overall causative thing the agent is causing such and such is true, here's how we explain all of those things. Here's how we explain away all the things that don't fit. And then you say, but if that thing weren't true, if it wasn't a human, if it weren't a human carcinogen, say, then we still have all the facts there. They have to have an alternative set of explanations because the facts are there. And you can compare the relative plausibility of those kinds of, of, of things. And this is a way of forcing you to write down your judgment. Well, I think that's what Bradford Hill is saying when he said, according to his criteria there, the fundamental question, is there any other way of explaining the set of facts before us? Is there any other answer equally or more likely than cause and effect? That accounts table is the direct way to try to evaluate this kind of a proposition, and I think that would be a good prescription for how to move forward. And this shows where the strengths and weaknesses are and so on and so forth, and with that I will finish. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Romberg, we have uh, just uh, time for one or two questions. There'll be more time this afternoon. The tables, uh, the chairs are lined up for, for detailed questions. There's one, one there. Oh, thank you. Please just say who you are. When yes, yes, of course. I uh, if, if Hello? Yeah. Okay. Um, good morning. I'm Alberto Mantovani. I'm a toxicologist of the Italian National Health Institute as well as a EFSA panel expert. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have one point for my clarification. As you keenly pointed out, the uh, causal question is uh, a pivotal starting point for the whole process. But in, as far as I know, uh, the, the causal question is at least partly beyond the remit of the risk assessors and the, its formulation at least partly depends on a close interaction with the risk managers and the policy makers. So it's uh, rather beyond the risk assessment science. Uh, the, did I misunderstand or can you comment please? Um, no, I don't think you did misunderstand and I wish I had more time to talk about this problem formulation step. Everyone talks about it but know, knowing how to do it well is actually very difficult and I'm not sure we can point to a good example. But you're exactly right. At that early stage, you have to talk with the risk managers and say, what kind of distinctions do you need to make in order to solve your question? And what, how deeply into this question do you have to resolve things in order to know which side of, of, a, of a decision you are going to come out on? And that, I think, is really important to do. And as I tried to suggest, also these sort of, you know, these sort of subsidiary scientific questions that, that, you know, you won't really be able to get a satisfactory scientific interpretation of this without settling this difficult case-specific scientific question. Putting those on the table first, deciding which ones need to be resolved in order to move ahead is very important. Okay. One more question? Another question? Another question? No more questions? Okay, so... Many thanks indeed for that excellent introduction.